Okay, today is May 20th, 2023, and we have a very special guest on the show today, Dr. Maureen Warner-Lewis. Dr. Warner-Lewis is Professor Emerita of African Caribbean Language and Orature in the Department of Literatures and English, University of the West Indies. Dr. Lewis was born in, in the Twin Island, Island Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Warner Lewis has, hailed, has been hailed as an educator extraordinaire. Dr. Warner Lewis has taught at both the secondary and tertiary educational level in Trinidad and Tobago, has taught in Nigeria and at the University of West Indies. Dr. Warner Lewis's career has focused on the linguistic heritage and unique cultural traditions of the African diaspora of the Caribbean. Her area of focus has been to recover the links between African cultures and Caribbean cultures. Dr. Warner Lewis has received several international, regional, and national book awards and is known worldwide for her comprehensive and authoritative research. Some of Dr. Warner Lewis's awards include the fact that she's a two-time winner of the internationally acclaimed uh, Gordon K. and Sybil Lewis, Sybil Lewis Award, the Gold Musgrave Medal of the Institute of Jamaica, and was inducted into the Literary Hall of Fame of Tobago. Dr. Warner Lewis, thank you so much for coming on the show and welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Ren. Mm -hmm. Well, um, we wanted to talk to you about the importance and impact of African languages on Caribbean languages and culture. What are some of the linguistic links between Africa and the Caribbean in terms of language and culture? Oh, well, there are several. I'll begin with, with culture generally. Language is a part of culture, but I, um, since we are going to speak mainly about language, I'll begin with the general overview of culture. Um, up to, to maybe the early part of the 20th century, um, African descended women in the Caribbean tended to wear head ties. Um, this is a carryover from, from Africa. And um, even today in places like Dominica, the island of Dominica in the Caribbean, um, the national dress includes um, uh, head ties. And these head ties have particular meanings depending on how they are tied. Um, the same is, is true for a place like Suriname on the northern coast of South America, uh, which is Dutch speaking. Um, so that, and the use in the Caribbean of um, long um, skirts traditional year, um, and the use of the shawl, uh, these used to be um, necessary and important for women's dress uh, long ago. Uh, that is the use of head ties, for instance, has largely gone out of, of um, fashion. Um, but say um, the market women of Jamaica have traditionally used head ties and uh, head ties are still used in some of the Afri African Caribbean religions in the Caribbean, like among the shouters and shakers of St. Vincent, the spiritual Baptists of Trinidad, the uh, revival um, religions of Jamaica, etc. So there's dress, there's food, the use of yam, which is itself an African um, crop, um, the, the, the presence of certain kinds of corn or maize in Caribbean food, um, like cuckoo in Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean. Um, or turn meal as they call it here in Jamaica. Uh, so th there's there's food. I, I won't go into a whole lot of, of these things since we are going to come around to language. Um, there's religion, of course. Um, the, the 
presence of dance in uh, Afro-Caribbean religious ceremonies. Um, uh, so there's dance, there's music, uh, the use of certain um, instruments, particularly various types of drums. And in Cuba, for instance, you have the retention of the Yoruba um, uh, talk bata drum, which is hit on both both sides, and uh, the the use of the calabash with either but netted um, buttons or beads on the outside, called um, um, shekere in Yoruba. Um, uh, the banj banja, which is in the United States, um, becomes banjo, um, which is a uh, derives from a uh, Angola Angolan um, instrument called imbanza, and so on. So the um, a no number of musical instruments, etc. The use of of um, and uh, the use of nonverbal language, such as the what is called in Jamaica kistit, and in Trinidad and the Eastern Caribbean, it's known as chups, uh, to signal disdain and so on. Um, the use of eye communication to you know if you're talking, if two people are talking about a third person who is in the vicinity, the use of the eyes to signal that you're talking about that person over there and so on. Uh, and the emphasis on, on gesturing of the hands. Well, in different cultures all over the world, um, hand movements have different meanings and so on. But um, the, the, sometimes when you see African people talking, you see certain uh, hand gestures that are used here. These have not been codified, um, but maybe we can get on the language now. <laughs> um, uh, well, uh, in, in language, I will just say generally to start off, um, the influence of African languages on the phonology or the sound systems of the Creole languages which are spoken um, in the Caribbean. Uh, for instance, with regard to English, the, and that this um, affects American um, uh, Black English as well, the tendency to get rid of um, um, Co uh, consonant clusters. Um, so in Jamaica, for instance, people would tend to say sweet, sweet uh, rather than sw sweet. Uh, they will, in, in other words, they will interpose a, a, a vowel between s and w, sweet or simit rather than smith, um, they'd interpose a, 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 a vowel in between the s and the m, so it becomes simit. And of course, th, the endings like th become t, and um, ld would, be, would just be uh, rather than hold, it would be whole, and so on. So the way in which consonants are dealt with, um, what happens is that in, in several African languages, you don't have those types of cons consonant clusters, so that um, the attempt to, those consonant clusters tend to be simplified in Caribbean Creoles. Um, there are other aspects of phonology and sound system. Um, 
and one aspect of phonology that is still giving some trouble and people have been, um, linguists have been trying to deal with it is intonation. Um, the way in which the, the voice goes up and down in um, Caribbean Creoles is not the same as it is in standard English. Um, and therefore one suspects that there are West African influences at work, but this is, this is still being discussed and researched. So you have the matter of phonology. There's also the, the matter of, um, of idiom. Uh, the, um, the, for instance, there's a saying in Jamaica, from me I dare me knee, which means from the time I was very small and my eyes were where my knee is now. Um, um, that kind of expression or people, somebody would say, kill the light, by which they mean to take off the light. But this is a, a, an idiom which is a direct translation of um, certain idioms in, in, um, in West African languages. Um, um, uh, or you will have a phrase like carry go bring come in Jamaica, where you have what in lingu linguistics is called the use of serial verbs, carry, go, bring, come. And that means um, take it and bring it. Um, so, so instead of using one verb as in English, you have a, a, a construction of two or three verbs um, following in sequence. Um, you, in West Africa, you would say something like take, take the fowl, bring, or take the hoe, um, dig. Um, and rather than the use of one verb, as in English, dig the hole, you'd have take the, um, and the name of the instrument, take the knife, kill. Uh, so that that type of, of sequence um, bears resemblance to West African languages. And then there's the, the matter of um, the matter of, of a number of lexical items like day clean, which means dawn in English, D-A-W-N, and expressed as the sky being lightened in West Africa or the term door mouth, which means the doorway in, in English, or foot bottom, as the Jamaicans say it, the sole of your foot, um, or the hand middle, the middle of your hand, the palm of your hand, or hard ears, meaning um, that, um, or as some West African languages would say, stick break in your ears, that you, you are stubborn. You, <laughs> you know, you, you're not listening to what I'm saying or you're not obedient. Stick break in your ears or your hard ears. And um, bad mouth, meaning um, to speak ill of someone and so on. So there are a number of, in that type, uh, we can, I may remember some later on um, and mention them. Or we have um, the way in which pronouns are used and deployed in Creoles. Now, in 
English, modern English does not distinguish between you singular and you plural. Both set senses require you simply to use the, the pronoun you. In West African languages, there's a difference between you singular and you plural. Much as in French or Spanish, that also obtains that there's a difference. And the difference may have to do, as in West African languages, with uh, respect uh, so that you may, as, as, a, as a way of respect, speaking respectfully to someone, addressing someone respectfully, even though it is a singular person, you may use the, you may be required to use the plural form. So in, um, in Igbo, um, they use the, the, the word unu, meaning you plural. In Barbados, they use wuna, which means you plural. In Jamaica, they use unu as in Igbo. Um, the, another, another, um, in, in the Creoles, you would say you singular and you all plural, or as we say in Trinidad, all you plural. And in a number of West African languages, there is not a distinction made between he and she. In other words, there is not a gender specific application. So both he and she in say uh, uh, the Yoruba language of West Africa, you would simply say, oh, that O stands for he or she, and the meaning would um, be interpreted according to whatever the conversation was dealing with. If it was dealing with a he, then it would be understood that that O is referring to a male. And if the previous conversation referred to a female, then uh, that the same O would uh, refer, be understood as referring to a female. Now, in the Creoles, for instance, in French Creoles, um, you would just say E um, coming off from the French I L E. Um, so we had a, a neighbor in 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 Tunapuna where I lived in Trinidad, and she spoke French Creole, and she would be talking about her granddaughter, and she would con constantly say E, E this, E that, E gone to work, and but you know because of the previous conversation, you know that she's talking about the granddaughter, not a male. Um, in Jamaica, of course, that he or she is realized or, or pronounced as him, Come, um, based on English, him, H-I-M. So it's Im, Im, Im talk Im talk bad or Im this and that and it can be either he or she depending on the context of the conversa previous conversation. So I, I'll, I'll leave the matter of, of um, the continuities between West African languages and uh, the Creoles. I'll leave it there for now. <laughs> we may come back to it a little later. 
thank you for outlining all of that and explaining all of that. Um, and I had a sort of a follow up question. Um, you know, yesterday was the anniversary of Malcolm X's 98th birthday. Malcolm X often spoke about the importance of language and one's mother tongue and its connection to one's roots and history. Um, and on January 24th, 1964, Malcolm X gave a speech about, quote, Afri Afro-American history. And in the speech, he discussed Black History Week. Uh, back then, it, uh, it was Black History Week, not month. Um, and he discussed how taking away enslaved Africans' language was an in intentional tool of the enslavers. And I want to read to you uh, a quote from, a, from that speech and get your thoughts. It's, it's a bit of a long quote, so uh, please bear with me. Um, quote, the slave master knew that he couldn't make these people's uh, slaves until uh, he first made them dumb. And one of the best ways to make a man dumb is to take his, his tongue, take his language. Once your language is gone, you're a dummy. You can't communicate with people or, the, or your relatives. You can never have access to information from your family. You just can't communicate. Also, if, you, if you'll notice the natural tongue that one speaks is referred to as one's mother tongue. Whenever you find as many people as we are who aren't able to speak any mother tongue, why? That's evidence right there. Something was done to our mother. Something had to have happened to her. They have laws in the, they had laws in those days that made it mandatory for a black child to be taken from its mother as fast as that child was born. The mother never had a chance to rear it. The child would be brought up somewhere else away from the mother so that the mother couldn't teach the child what she knew about itself, about her past, about its heritage. It would never it would have to grow up in complete darkness, knowing nothing about the land where it came from or the people that it came from, not even about its own mother. There was no relationship between the black child and its mother. It was against the law. And if the master would ever find any of those children who had any knowledge of its mother tongue, the child was put to death. They had to, to stamp out the language. They did it scientifically. Uh, if if they found that found any one of them that could speak it off went its head or they would put it to death and they would kill it in front of the mother if necessary this is this is history this is how they took our took your language it doesn't it didn't lose it it didn't evaporate they took it with scientific process because they knew they had to take it to make you dumb end quote um of course i didn't do malcolm x uh, justice uh reading that quote um, but I, I did want to get your reaction to that quote in the context of what we're discussing. All right. Well, uh, let's say that some of this is true, but I think that it's in general, it's overstated. Um, you know, when you're building a case, you, there may be some element of exaggeration. And I think that there is some exaggeration there. But this is not to say that some of what Malcolm said uh, was not true. It, it, it was true that attempts would have been made from time to time to prevent people from speaking their own language. One of the reasons for this was um, the need to make the slaves um, adjust to their new environment. They didn't grow up on a, a plantation, um, you know, cultivating a monocrop as they had to do in the plantations of the Caribbean and, and the Americas. So if, if the slave had to obey instructions and be taught how to perform, how to operate in a new environment, it had to learn the language or languages of the new environment so that it was a necessity 
for purposes of work and acclimatization to a new system. There was also the fear on the part of the masters and the slave um, hierarchy, the, the slave master hierarchy, the bookkeepers and overseers and so on. There was the fear that people who continued to speak their native languages would also use their language to conspire against the system into which they had been brought. So efforts obviously would have been made to prevent people from speaking their own language because they may have been saying things, for instance, they may have been saying, kill that man there and you wouldn't know because they are talking in their own language and that makes people who don't understand the language uncomfortable. As a matter of fact, one of the frequent phrases that I heard in um, while collecting my African language data in Trinidad was the Yoruba phrase, Olokpa and that meant the policeman is coming because the, the Africans did not like the police because the police were preventing them from doing A and preventing them from doing B and etc. So they had, they were suspicious. They, the enslaved um, or indentured were suspicious of police. Olokpa also probably referred to someone like a, 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 an overseer, not just a policeman in the official sense of the word, but someone who carried a stick. That's what literally what Olokpa means. Someone who carries a stick. So that person is coming. So whatever you're doing that is against the law of this new environment, stop doing it because you are being watched and you will soon have a stick in your back. So there are many reasons, there are several reasons for trying to prevent people from speaking their own language. But the very fact that there are laws or, or that, that there, was, there were attempts at prevention indicates that people did speak their own languages. So um, in a sense, Malcolm was, was right and he was wrong because the owners of slaves did not um, ha had to calculate that if they killed a human being or, or this slave, they were killing money because each slave co cost a certain amount and could produce a certain amount of, of, of profit for the owner. So people were not killed willy-nilly. They were certainly, if they were caught in conspiracy, they were killed. But um, you there were other forms of punishment under uh, the slave regime that involved flogging and serious flogging or deprivation of limbs, of ears, of hands, of, of toes, of fingers, of nose. Some of the punishments meted out to the enslaved are so horrendous that it would make your stomach sick. So while it is true that people were punished 
and one of the punishments was for speaking their own language. On the other hand, you have, there is documentation that certain slave owners um, advised their, their European workforce to link slaves who spoke the same language so that the newcomers would be able to, to follow instructions in this new regime of life and work. There is evidence of, um, of slave owners instructing their workers, their white workers, to bring together um, enslaved people who spoke the same language. So, you know, life is not built on absolutes. There are variations. So yes, Malcolm is right that there, there, were, there were efforts to separate people who spoke the same language. But it is also a fact that some shipments, several shipments of enslaved people coming from um, Central Africa or from the Guinea coast and all along West Africa, that these boats brought people who tended to be from a certain catchment geographical area. And that those people coming from certain given geographical areas would be speaking languages that were either similar or they were dialects of this regional dialects of the same language. So people coming from the Niger Delta area would tend to be speaking either dialects of Igbo or dialects of ethic or dialects of Ibibio. So um, as I said, each slave ship would tend to be bringing people from the catchment areas where they collected um, their slave um, cargo from. So that there were people, and if you read the, 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 um, very carefully, the accounts of the slave um, captains and so on, you would realize that there were people on the same shipment who were speaking the same language. And certainly when the overseers and so on went to the docks, wherever, to collect, to, to, to choose their slaves, those that they would buy, they did not ask them what language they spoke. And they would not have known that certain people were speaking the same language or languages that were what we call in linguistics mutually intelligible. So that if even I was speaking the language of say of the north of England and the, that it, people from the south of England would be able to understand maybe 90% of what I said. So this is what happened with the enslaved people that it was not always possible to separate um, people uh, who spoke the same language. It was not, it just was not possible to do this under the circumstances of people being kidnapped from particular areas and so on. And when they landed in the, in the ports of the Caribbean or North America or whatever, that two or three, at least, if not more, people who could speak, understand each other's language got together. But that, and this is why the um, this is why 
um, th um, the slave owners and legislators from time to time brought in rules about trying to separate people who spoke the same language because people who are speaking languages that were mutually intelligible. And this is why whenever there was a, a, a revolt, the, these laws came in. You see, they would say, the legislators would say, you see, they were speaking their same language, they're the same Coromanti people. Um, and that is why they were able to, to foment a revolt because they were collaborating together. So, you know, you, you, you're talking about a, a centuries of this institution of um, the transatlantic slave and slave trade. So that, you know, the laws would have changed from time to time, depending on the circumstances of each, um, each locale. Thank you for explaining that. Um, and I guess a follow-up question is, can you also explain the circumstances under which some of these languages came to be known in the into the 20th century, um, the context of these remnant languages, and give examples of their impacts on, on the Creoles of today? Uh -huh. All right. Now, um, in 1966, which is uh, a little more than 50 years ago, 60, 70 years ago, um, I began collecting, um, looking for people in my island, um, Trinidad, um, people who could remember African languages. And I was able to gather and collect tape record um, texts, oral texts from people who were, I would say the youngest at that time was 60 years old. The oldest was 103. Uh, so that these people were born um, these are people who were born towards the end of the 19th century, going into the beginning of the 20th century. And these people grew up with parents and grandparents who had been captured, kidnapped, um, and enslaved, um, brought down from the hinterland of either um, West Africa, uh, the north of, of Nigeria, today's Nigeria. Of course, Nigeria didn't exist at that time. Um, or brought down from the interior of the Congo Basin, brought down to the coast and, and put on ships and brought to, they were being brought to the, what I call the West Atlantic. They were being brought to the Caribbean and the Americas. Some boats probably, especially those from Central Africa, that is Congo and Angola, they were largely headed to Brazil. The other groups of people headed for the Caribbean, Central America and North America. Because slavery was the slavery itself was not abolished in the West Atlantic until well into the, um, the 19th century. In the United States, as you know, it was 1865 that slavery was abolished. 
in the Dutch Antilles, it was about 1863, I think. In Cuba, it was 18, 1880, was it? And Brazil, it was 1888. Uh, let's see, yes, Brazil was as late as 1888. In Cuba, it was 1880, I think. In the British colonies, it was 1838, largely. So that um, during the, for a good part of the 19th century, the transatlantic slave trade was still going on. Now, the British Parliament in either 1807 or 1808, 1809, um, abolished the trade in slaves. And they put out naval patrols off the coast of Guinea and off the Central African coast and also in the of the certain ports in the caribbean where they know they knew that slave ships were you know that was on the route of slave ship uh, of slave ships carrying enslaved people so and the british um lobbied other European countries and the United States to um, capture these slave ships and free the enslaved people. So that from about 1841, in, in the case of the British territories, um, the, the, the people who had been captured as slaves were then let off and um, um, who were in these slave ships that were still plying the trade. These enslaved people were let off at Freetown, Sierra Leone, or at St. Helena Island in the Mid-Atlantic or they were brought if the ship that was impounded was near a Caribbean port, they would let them off at the Bahamas or Jamaica or British Guyana or Trinidad. Why? Because the, the, the owners of plantations still needed manpower to run their, to, to operate their sugar plantations. So these people now freed, inverted commas, were inveigled into becoming indentured laborers. So they, they were hired for three years or five years or sometimes 10 years contract in these new environments so that you had enslaved people who were freed between the 1840s up to the 1880s and let off at different places in the Caribbean. And this is why it is the descendants of these indentured Africans who retained knowledge of African languages into the 20th century. So some of these um, indentured workers actually made contact in their new 
environments with people who had been previously enslaved. So the, the former slaves met up with a new batch of people who had been captured into slavery, but had been freed because of these naval patrols and so on. So it is, as I say, it is the children and grandchildren of these late immigrants who most retained the knowledge of African languages in the 1960s into the early 1970s when I interview, interviewed them. And they knew prayers, religious chants, and a number of domestic terms. Um, because growing up with parents and grandparents who spoke African languages and who, although working on sugar plantations and getting whipped still as if they were slaves, these parents and grandparents would teach them words like cooking pot, cutlass, food, uh, etc. Um, so, so a, a number of domestic words, keep quiet, go away, come, that type of, of household language, the, those, that was the kind of vocabulary that they got to know. And the, these, um, these people who I interviewed, they they knew they spoke African languages in their homes. They had spoken it in their homes. And they could they had a, a, a what we call an affective relationship with the, the, these languages. And the most of these languages were Yoruba. Kikongo, Hausa, and Fon. Fon is spoken in what used to be known as Dahomey and is now the Republic of Benin. For, um, for uh, um, Dahomey and Togo, that, that area. And Hausa, spoken in the north of Nigeria, the north of Ghana, uh, a, a wide belt uh, going east-west across the um, savannah area of West Africa. Kikongo, spoken in the Congo Basin area, going into Angola and um, Yoruba spoken in southwestern Nigeria and Dahomey. And as I say, these old people had a fond relationship with the African languages because they associated it with their youth and they associated it with their parents and grandparents who they remembered very clearly in their, you know, in their memories. And for instance, one lady, she told me whenever she went to Port of Spain to buy shoes, she would go to a particular shop. Well, most probably she went to a shop that was called Butter. The Bata, B-A-T-A, was a name brand shoe that we had in Trinidad at the time. But Bata, for a Yoruba person, Bata means shoe. So she would go to the store and when she got 
a proper fit. She would sing in Yoruba. And the store clerks, you know, knew her. And she would sing, Mother, come and see me. Father, come and see me. The golden shoes that I wear on my feet. And she would sing like that and the store clerks would, I suppose, humor her and so on. Another lady, she was so glad when she saw me. You know, I would go to every year that I went on my research trips. I would go to see her because she knew Yoruba very well. And she she um she was glad one year when I went to see her. And what did she do? She burst out into song. And it is a song of um it's a courtship song. In this song, um the the singer is saying, I went to the riverside. And when I was at the riverside, a man saw me and he says, I would like to be your husband. And she says, I have a husband already. And he says, well, no matter, I will be your boyfriend. <laughs> um, how did that song go? Um, money, I say, money. Um, uh, Uh, oh boy, I've I've forgotten the the <laughs> words of that song. Uh, if I remember, I'll come back to it. But you know, it the, it it expressed the emotions. Now, interestingly, a number of the songs that they remembered had to do with war, and this is because the Yoruba people were experiencing a series of civil wars during the 19th century. And this was the reason why so many of them were being captured because they were war captives. And that is how they came to be enslaved. So, you know, you have a song saying, come three by three, three by three, you know, war has broken out. Or another one that says, you know, disaster has, happened, you know, or we, we made a conspiracy and it has failed, uh, things like that. Um, the, then you have a, a number of the songs, uh, also um, songs to the Orisha and um, the, the um, so they sing to the, Shango, the god of lightning. They sing to Ogun, the god of iron. They sing to Oya, the wife of Shango, the chief wife of Shango, and she's the, the mother of tempests and whirlwinds. She's also the name they give to what we call the River Nigel. So, you know, they, they sing to Shokpana who is the god of disease, um, particularly smallpox. So they sing to Osain, who is the god of healing, and he deals with herbs because, of course, the reliance on herbal medicines. So those particular um, religious chants are known not only by those old people that I met, but also by generations today as we speak, because they are songs to the Orisha. The Orisha are the deity, the Yoruba deities. And in Trinidad and Tobago and in Grenada, um, the, 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 religious ceremonies to the deities, the Yoruba deities are still maintained. So those 
chants are still used even by generations who don't necessarily know the meanings of those songs, but they know which deity it, you know, the songs relate to. Well, several years ago, I published um, the translations of over a hundred of these songs. So that nowadays um, the Orisha adherents are better informed about the meanings of these chants. In addition to which, a number of Orisha practitioners have gone to Nigeria or have gone to Brazil or have gone to Cuba where these rites are still observed and where these languages are still used in, in religious worship. So, you know, th that is, that is in, in short is, gives some idea of the, the way in which, the context in which um, some of these African language texts are still used. I may also mention that in Cuba, I don't know if you're aware that the, the religion called Santeria or um, um, Och, Och, oh dear, Regla de, o, de, de Ocha um, is quite strong. And there are persons I met in Cuba who could recite in Yoruba you know, fairly lengthy um, prayers and so on. Uh, so that the, the, the languages, although largely, these African languages, although they are largely extinct in the Caribbean, still inhabit certain sort of crevices of, of use in, in the, in, Caribbean spaces. <clears throat> Thank you for outlining all of that. Um, and then a sort of a quick follow up question. Have you seen the Netflix documentary Bigger Than Africa, Bigger Than Africa, which um, outlines <coughs> the Yoruba history in Brazil, Cuba and Trinidad and Tobago? Yes, I, I think I saw I saw it. Not I think I did look at it. <laughs> Somebody advised me about it. Um, yes, I saw it. I saw it. Did you think it was it was well done? I mean, I, I don't want to uh, put you yeah, on the spot. Yes, yeah, yes, yes, yes. I would say so. I would say so. Um, uh, well, I mean, you could do more. Uh, there's there's more that could be done, but it was it was well done. It's a lot to cover. Um, you know, to talk about the circumstances under which particularly the Yoruba um, came, as I say, because of these civil wars. And we, we see what is happening in Sudan now, and you see what, what civil wars do, you know, people begin to scatter uh, Ukraine, people scatter mm -hmm. uh, and so on. And with that comes their, their language. And we need to, to remember that although the, 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 um, I speak about these languages being retained by the children and grandchildren of, of enslaved slash indentured people, that we, uh, I think we are in a position, a better position with that knowledge to extrapolate to the conditions of slavery itself in the Americas and realize that there, there must have been people who carried on their, who had in their memories, these are human beings that we are talking about. We are not talking about machines. We are talking about human beings who are in exile. Granted that the, the conditions under which they travel, etc., were horrible, but people don't lose the memory of who they are 
of their names, of their parents, of you know, of their past. They don't lose the memory of these things. So that these we have we have lost a lot of these memories because these people didn't write anything. Particularly, unfortunately, many of them did not write. And so, uh, 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 I should mention in, in the in the context of writing, I should mention that one of the languages that was retained in Trinidad was Arabic, because some of the people who came were Muslims, because apart from the Yoruba wars, you also had jihad going on in the Nigeria area. And so that there was conflict between the Yorubas and the jihadists from the north. So that some of the war captives were Muslims themselves. So, um, so and you had people bringing over old Korans and so on with them. By the time I met up with them, they couldn't find where the Korans were and so on, but they knew that their parents had the Quran and so on. So um, in, in slavery, you must have had people who kept certain knowledge, certain skills alive so that we, we, we have to be, we have to sort of sift as we sift with the Malcolm X statement. We have to sift these statements which lean towards total dispossession. The Africans who came were not totally dispossessed. Masters from time to time would have tried to totally dispossess them, but they were not totally dispossessed. They kept up their drumming that is why the, the masters had to keep making laws all the time. You know, these people must be prevented from drumming at Christmas time or whenever. They had to reiterate these um, these laws over and over again because they were clearly being broken. The people were speaking, the people were drumming, the people were doing their little uh, um, sculpture work they couldn't do you know the kind of cloth the the weaving and so on as they had done in their homelands but they knew about farming they knew about looking after cattle those who came from cattle areas they knew how to look after horses and all of that so they had things in their heads and if we believe totally in the total dispossession story, the, that narrative, then we are saying that, you know, these people had nothing inside there. So we have to, we have to moderate our understanding of what it meant to be an enslaved person and, you know, and how the enslaved people had to modify their way of life, modify their languages, and modify their skills in these new environments. Thank you. And I guess th this is sort of an obvious question, but I still think it's worth asking, and, and you've hinted at it in so many different ways, but why is it so important today to continue to learn and preserve these languages, culture, and history? Well, now, languages, languages have to be functional. Their language presupposes a use or uses. And therefore, uh, unless some West Africans or some African country or nation becomes a hegemon there would be no immediate no pressing need for the the language that you know the, in which those people operate for for you to to want to learn those languages 
in, in the in Trinidad, for instance, there were, there are certain individuals I met or heard of who tried to bring back the language, you know, and so on. But until that, those languages have some everyday use. Uh, that's that's the power of English today. Eng uh, English in the 15th and 16th centuries, the, the English had to fight to get their language acknowledged as a respectable language. And people were killed for trying to translate the Bible into English. Look at English nowadays. Everybody in the world wants to learn to speak English because of certain political and trade reasons that this little island off of the European continent by its naval power and its harnessing of military technology conquered so much of the world that by the 20th century, they had a, a one third of the world's population. And that is their power. We don't know another hundred years from now what the linga franca of the world would be. Mm -hmm. At one time it was French and the Paul, Paul, um, what is um, Macron, you know, still has a dream of having African countries learn French. But the days of the French superiority of language is gone. So it is not, it, it is not um, reasonable at this point in time to talk about the importance of learning a West African or an African language. One can learn such languages for various reasons. I, I learned it for academic and cultural and historical reasons in order to understand my history better so that I could get inside the heads of the ancestors who came to these parts. I don't know who my ancestors are as Africans and I am not prepared to do the DNA test to work that out. But so, um, and one may one may learn such uh, um, such languages, where um, African languages. Maybe if you are in the diplomatic service or want to go enter the diplomatic service, or particularly want to trade with a particular place, and it is always helpful to at least know some of the basics of of foreign languages the more languages you learn or know or can speak is the smoother your social and trade relations can proceed so just as one may learn french or spanish or portuguese you can learn um Sutu or Kikongo or Wolof or whatever. And certainly in terms of tracing, it is um, for, for my purposes of cultural identification and historical connections, it suits me to know, for instance, that Sukunya, which is a term we use in Trinidad for the witch that flies like a ball of fire and comes and sucks your blood and so on. Sukunya is a Wolof term. 
it's it's it it tells you something about the people who came to to the island maybe not directly from africa maybe not because people some of the enslaved people who came to trinidad came via haiti new orleans martinique and guadeloupe and these are all french creole speaking places so that they you would have to know about the the history of the french um uh, slave transatlantic slave trade to understand the importance of the the gambia area the area of, of present day senegal and the gambia and so on to understand how these people from that part of the world came to um came to our our shores so for instance in the play in the film amistad i think it's the susu language they're speaking from again from that same area of the senegambia and so the name buki which is the name of a character in haitian folklore is again from that senegambian area um um uh, some of the names of the characters in anansi stories are from the tree speaking area of today's ghana and togo and ivory coast so in you have in jamaican folklore you have a character called asunu that's an elephant anansi himself is the name of the spider of um akan speaking people the folk tales of the akan speaking people so you get you you know you 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 get to 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 understand a little better the richness of your your own formation so that is a kind of historical knowledge that you get from learning a certain amount of west african languages if you meet is maybe just you know words in their lexicon in their their dictionary words um you you have um the, the word dotty which is used in in jamaica people used to think it it was a, a form of dirt but it really it refers to the dust to, to the ground dotty it's a tree word and the use of in jamaica they use the word yard to refer to their home and again this is uh, from the from the um kikongo angola area they use the word yadi and so it becomes <laughs> yard here yeah, you know and so on um at um then the proverbs the proverbs of the caribbean are also a number of them some of them are english but some of them are african many of them uh learn to dance a yard before you go a foreign you have you have to learn learn how to conduct yourself at home a yard before you go a foreign before you go into the wider world one time a mistake second time a purpose third time a habit kikongo one time a mistake you do something once it could be a mistake you do it a second time is a purpose you have done it purposefully and the third time by the time you do the same thing a, a third time it has become a habit cockroach no business in the foul fight that is known all through the caribbean again um from the congo and also among the tree people um and um there's a, a an interesting proverb 
Pig asked him, Mother, why mouth so long? Him say, you will grow, you will see. <laughs> <laughs> that comes from among the uh, people of Benin City, the Edo people. Pig asked him, Mama, why, why mouth so long? Hmm. Him say, you will grow, <laughs> you will see. It will happen to you too. <laughs> <laughs> And so on. So there's so much, so many things that link us um, in culture and language. The use of the word yaya. Um, recently, I was in a dentist's office, and this little boy talking to his mother, um, uh, talking to an older person. He called her yaya. That's his grandmother. That's a kikongo term mm. for grandmother. It's also used to refer to a mid, the, the local midwives in the days when, uh, you know, some elder woman in the village would deliver the babies. She was a yaya. And in Jamaica still, um, some elderly men are referred to as tata. That's um, Kikongo for father. These are respectful terms. And these terms were used in, in um, slavery time. Tata and Yaya, meaning grandfather and grandmother, was used in the Congo and by some older Caribbean people. These modes of address were noted by the writer Brian Edwards, who said that the slave usage of uncle and daddy, daddy is a fancy term, um, did not indicate blood ties, but respect and affection. So, you know, uh, 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 up to now in Jamaica, um, people would refer to me, seeing my gray hairs, they would refer to me as mommy. And so now some middle class people or people who don't know about this African background, and that's a lot of people, mm -hmm. um, you know, take offense and say, I'm not your mother. <laughs> but the, 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 the person, the younger person has used the word not to say that you are my mother, but it is a term of respect for an elder person. And that's part of the, the rules of African courtesy. Or you may call the person auntie or daddy, if it's a male. So, you know, there, 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 there are certain, certain ways, certain folk ways, which have remained in the Caribbean, but which are not understood especially as people ascend the social ladder and move further and further away from the environments in which African type ways are practiced. Thank you for sharing all of that. The, I guess the last question I have, and, and I think it's related um, is, you know, on our show, we just, uh, we try to highlight um, the need and importance for Pan-Africanism and internationalism today. Um, and in the context of the discussion we've been having today, you know, why, in your view, why are Pan-Africanism and or internationalism important to any struggle for liberation? Well, um, it, it, gives you, it gives you a better grounding, a better rationale for Pan-Africanism internationalism, etc. To understand you, you you have to under why why is it that Europeans act in certain ways? Why do they have certain values? It has to do with their history, all those castles and all those things that they have, the things that you trod about and see this piece of furniture and that portrait of that one and so on. That 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 is, is what has, it builds their confidence. Their confidence, because 
they, 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 they have just appeared from Mars. They have a certain history, a certain trajectory in their historical development. Why is Putin fighting for Ukraine? Why is he fighting for Crimea? He gave a whole long spiel about it that doesn't make sense to the West. But it has to do with Russian history, who they think they are. Mm -hmm. Why they put a, 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 a nuclear station in Ukraine? Why they, do they have a phrase, Moscow and Kiev? In, in their minds, Ukraine is part of them. Even though as far as they're concerned, the, the Ukrainian language is, is debased. Russian. Yeah. So they don't want to lose that. And look at the confusion that they have created. So you know, you you this the the knowledge of I mean the, the, the kind of confidence which a number of people in, in Trinidad say and in the wider Caribbean have about their the their Africanness um about the the significance and the philosophy behind certain African religious practices. It comes from the knowledge that you know researchers have found that reestablishes, yes, we look like Africans. The physiognomy is the same, but you also want to do, to do, to know how are you culturally connected? Is there still a connection, and what are the connections that we need to discard? What is beneficial? What strengthens me, and what weakens me? So you know it's. Uh, as a, it's it's like family history. I feel better for knowing my family history. You know, who are my ancestors? I know I know up to a certain thing. Who who are they? What were their aspirations? What what actions did they take that have given me a certain advantage in X field or Y field? What are the ways that they have, that they had? What are the illnesses that they had, that I have? You know, they, 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 these things, they, in, they make you richer in your self-knowledge and your self-respect. And Therefore, you know, um, it's important to know the links, just as it is important for the people in Africa to understand that they, they are as ignorant of our situation as we are of theirs. And that, that is a weakness. They should know some years ago, <laughs> I remember at a conference or something, one, one, one Nigerian man got up and said, he don't understand what is all this fuss about slavery and, and this and that and the next and so on. I mean, <laughs> he, he, was, he, he was nearly annihilated, you know, um, because he, he, but even in Africa, there, there is a stigma about slavery, but he does not understand how the damage that our ancestors have suffered because of a, a system of slavery which didn't exist there. They had slavery, but it was not the same, uh, of the same nature and quality. And didn't have all these color ramifications. 
So he, 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 he spoke out of ignorance. Just as we also speak out of ignorance, people who in this part of the world say, oh, but the Africans, they, they, they caught people to and enslaved them, which is true. But they wouldn't have been doing it if the Europeans hadn't gone there and said, we need people. And even today, they are always collaborators. There are always people who say, oh, I can make money this way. If I sell five, I can get this and I can maybe buy a piece of land or set up in some kind of trade or something. There are always people who would collaborate. Even in the Holocaust, they were collaborators. So, you know, um, we need to more sensitively engage with those from whom we came and who, who share some of the same problems, the same issues of education, of health, of poor sanitation, of climate change, of whatever. They, they, they are in the same, same boat as we are. So we need to understand them and they need to understand us. Thank you for that explanation. Those are all the questions I have for you today. I could ask, I feel like I could ask you questions for days, <laughs> but I don't know if there's anything you want to discuss before we close. Not, not really, not really. I mean, one can go on with examples and examples and examples. Uh, oh, maybe I should. Yeah, that is a love song that the old lady sang to me. That we, we are, um, it meant uh, I went to the riverside and a man saw me and he said, I want to be your husband. And I said, I have a husband already. He says, well, uh, I will be the boyfriend. <laughs> yeah. And so, so, you know, it, it was really lovely meeting with those old people. And they were so glad to, that somebody was interested in these old thoughts that they had and this old knowledge that they had and they would just spill out you know song after song that that's that song says um it, it's talking about a bird the bird carry me home. Um, no one goes on a journey and does not return home. And, you know, th th these are songs of longing, songs of lament. And I, when I was in Nigeria, I would hear that being played on the, that song being played on the talking drums. Dum, 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 dum. And so on. It's an old folk song. And of course, the people in in the Caribbean would be singing it about wanting to go to that home over there, and so on. Almost songs, like a, of, a, songs of lament and longing. Mm. Well, I'm I'm so glad you remembered the song <laughs> um, and were able to share it with us. And it's been an honor meeting you, speaking with you, learning more from you. Um, and I hope to have you back on the, sh the show again sometime. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thanks for your hospitality and thanks for asking me. <laughs> <laughs>